Ladies and gentlemen, can you please get ready to welcome Lord Montague and the No Time to Die Special Effects Supervisor, Chris Corbold. Welcome everybody, uh, and a special welcome to Chris Corbold, the special effects supervisor uh, from, from the film. Um, what you're seeing is unrehearsed, and, and uh, that shows because having stopped the car, I then discovered I didn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> you might think that turning the key would do it, but it actually didn't. Anyway, it, it's off now. Um, Chris, can you tell me a bit about how some of, some of the driving now is actually done by remote control or using pods with the drivers on top? Yeah, there are various ways of doing, you know, when you've got the actors uh, inside the cars. Um, if Daniel had his way, he would do all the driving. But, but there are obviously reasons we need him for the rest of the film, so we have to rein him in a little bit. So we have a version of the Aston Martins where we have a pod on the top of the car. Uh, where we have a, a British Rally Cross champion in there, actually doing the driving while we've got cameras on Daniel and Lair inside. Um, you know, years ago you would have put the car on a low loader and tow it behind a vehicle, but you, you don't get the g-forces and the movements and, the, the, for want of a better word, the fear in their eyes when they're screaming into a corner with a rally, rally driving champion on the roof. It's a very different feel, so we, we, we tend to use them quite a bit these days. Now, a vehicle of a very different kind is the one above us here, the Stealth Glider, which um, sort of doesn't have its wings out, is that they're folded in at the moment. But can you tell me, did this actually leave the studio? Yes, we, we filmed with this um, on, we took it to, I think it was an Antonoff or a big cargo plane, which was Q's um, base in the air, and they're going off to the villain's lair. Uh, we had this mounted in the plane and we did the shot where we had Daniel um, and Lashada in there and we jerked this out at high speed, probably about 60 feet, so to give that feeling that it was going out the back of the plane. Uh, our, our CG friends took over after that because although we do great special effects, we're not that good to get that open up in mid-air. Uh, and then we took over back again in the villain's lair uh, where we had it coming out of the water and Bond and Lashana getting out of it. Um, but no, three in sequence. Yeah. So, um, we have something under here. Um, Chris, can you just tell me a little bit about... I mean, it's, it's easy to think this is the car from the film. Actually, it's not the car from the film. It's one of several, isn't it? Yes. We, um, when, it was decided, when it was decided to use the DB5, uh, the first thing we had to do was go to Aston Martin and, and sit sitting in a room with all their execs and their uh, creative team. And the first question they asked was, well, what car are you using? Which we replied, well, we'd like to use a DB5. That brought a big smile to all their faces. Um, then they said, um, how many do you think you need? And when we said 10, that smile quickly disappeared. <laughs> um, but they, they're used to that over the years. But, um, you know, we went through various options. Do we buy 10 original Aston Martins? Probably not an option, the cost they are. Uh, do we rent them from people? Or would you rent your cherished DB5 to James Bond film doing an action sequence, not an option. So we settled on that we would have two original Aston Martins for James Bond getting in and out of driving up, driving away. And then Aston Martin would then build us eight bespoke vehicles. Uh, we had two with the pods on the top. We had two fully kitted out with all the uh, gadgets. And then we had another four that were, for one of a better word, full stunt rally cars that would, you know, they could roll eight times and drive would still get out of the smile on his face so we had 10 in all to do that sequence right well listen i think that i know there's more detail under the cover that it would be worth us talking about but first of all 
I would like to ask you to help me to unveil the car, and then we'll talk a bit about the, the gadgets. Yeah. So I'm going to go around this side. It's always a dodgy moment, this. Okay, here we go. So for lovers of fine cars, it is a little distressing, I have to say, to see all this apparent damage. But Chris, just talk me through what we're looking at here. Well, you're, you're looking at a car that has been shot at all round by um, six or eight guys with machine guns, you know, with, with uh, Bond and Lair inside. You know, some of these impacts have been done uh, for real firing pellets at the windows. It has a full polycarbonate screen inside which stops any pellets going through so that the people inside are in absolute safety. Others that um, these ones are stuck on. We, we did real ones on the day, but um, the producers and the director and their infinite wisdom decided that when we got to Matera, we would do the last shot of the whole sequence first. Now, obviously, we didn't want to scratch up pristine Aston Martin before we started the sequence, so we, we embarked on putting uh, a vinyl on the side here and then painting the vinyl to what we thought was going to be the damage. And then, really, in, in, when we did shot the sequence, we really catered the damage, what happened, uh, to what this end result was. Um, these would have been the stuck-on ones that we put on to do that first scene at the end of the sequence. These real ones would be... Um, what we did with uh, Daniel in the car. There was a lot of talk about uh, do, we, do we stick with the traditional uh, Bond gadgets from Goldfinger? And if you remember, um, this DB5 or the DB5 was blown up in Skyfall and then reappeared in Spectre and Q's lab. So that gave us the opportunity to upgrade some of the, the gadgets. And uh, Kerry Fukunaga, the director, decided that he wanted to change the single barrel browning type gun coming out of the original headlights and went for these uh, multi, multi barrel mini guns, mm. which gave us the facility, you know, when it gets the final square, which we finally knew as donut square, that we could literally strafe 360 degrees around that square as the car donut is on the spot. We also had um, uh, spent shells coming out the side here, and there was a very tricky shot that we had to do with the camera here, where you saw the impacts, impacts in the background and the shells all coming out, so we had to make sure that the gun was perfectly lined up with where the, the bullet impacts were going off. Uh, we stuck with the, the traditional smoke screen, which uh, worked great and provided the means of escape. Uh, and we changed the spikes, tyre spikes coming out for little mini bomblets, which made it a little bit more spectacular. So all in all, we had a lot of fun. Uh, and um, th th in terms of the functionality of these, I mean, obviously we know what they did in the film, but what we see here is something that presumably, c c is, it, is it fixed? Can it, uh, can, it, can it come out and move in again? Yes, they're, 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 you know, I have a very clever team around me who, who, who design and build all these rigs. You know, the headlight was all a special headlight that we built. There's a, um, a linear actuator that brings the gun out. There's a, a motor that turns the barrel. Our friends in um, CGI put the muzzle flashes out the front because they weren't too keen on us trying to fire real bullets out of them. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's mechanical engineering. Yeah. And one of the more subtle things which, which I do like is uh, the, the changing number plate, which is, of course, no longer a rotating thing, which we've seen in the past, but LED. But actually works surprisingly well, and unless you're really aware of it, you don't even notice that it is LED. Yeah, I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I had my doubts about whether it would be bright enough uh, to mm. actually sharpen camera, but it, it actually did. I think the only sad fact is I don't think it appears in the film, Meg, does it? Um, <laughs> I don't think it's in the film. But, and I think it's got at least three different d numbers there. One British, one French and Italian, maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I know we, had, yeah. we got into trouble with one of the number plates because we found out we didn't own it. So uh, we had to... I, I thought we owned all the number plates throughout the years. It's, the number plates were originally taken from Goldfinger when they rotated oh, them in that, but right. somewhere along the line they sold one of them. Good. 
Well, Chris, thank you so much for talking us through this. Um, I think for us at the National Motor Museum, we are about telling the story of motoring, and that is the story of motoring to the present day and indeed into the future. And so coming together with you know, the most popular brand in entertainment, uh, which happens to feature a lot of cars anyway, for, for us is a wonderful partnership. And it's just great to have you here today to open the exhibition and to talk us through you know, some, some of the details that might otherwise be missed. So thank you very much, and I think we're both delighted to, to declare the exhibition open.